DIA Media, Canada's top black media provider. Whether you're looking for content from fashion, art, music, or simple lifestyle, we bring you the best the black community in Ottawa has to offer, and so much more. And better yet, do you have a project you need help with? Well, look no further. We provide equipment, studio, and office space, as well as a team of dedicated individuals to help you bring those ideas to life. So don't wait. Check out our new website at biamedia.ca for more information on how to contact us and start creating today. BIA Media. Your media, your way. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session, our last session of our seminar on the legacy and life of Paul Robeson. Um, so we are finishing up our four weeks. I have really enjoyed presenting this information. It's the first time we've had this seminar. And um, uh, you know, this, this last one, there will be a lot of in information. So make sure you're taking notes. Make sure you're using your, the course website associated with this course. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to give probably the final update to it that's not complete in terms of all of the documents that are going to be associated with the lecture today. But those documents will be up by the end of the day today. I'm going to go home and I'm going to take some time to uh, update the website. So make sure that you check that out. You send it to other people. All this is completely free. And we want to definitely popularize the memory of, the memory of Paul Robeson. Um, today's lecture, today's session will go a long way for us to understand why Paul Robeson was erased, how that happened, um, and the importance that we have to make sure that this, his memory doesn't go anywhere. And there's been a lot of um, resurrection of, of Paul Robeson's ideas and his memory, but we want to make sure it's done right, and we want to make sure that it continues into the next generation so folks know this great giant of the African world. So this week, we're going to be talking about Robeson as artist activist. You know, we started in week one, we talked about him as a scholar athlete. We talked about him as an amazing scholar and an amazing athlete. Again, as I started this class by saying a lot of the things about his life are incredible, and incredible with the actual definition of the word incredible. Like, you won't be able to believe this, that one man was this talented at so many things. So we traced Robeson's exploits as an athlete as a scholar in his early years, you know, getting an academic scholarship to university, then excelling on the football field and on the baseball diamond and on the basketball court, but primarily on the football field and how he became one of the first stars of what would become the NFL, one of the best defensive players in the, his the short history of that league. We talked about how he then transitioned to stage acting and singing uh, and became the most sought after black stage actor in America and the, one of the, the most popular singers in America, and eventually when he goes to London, he puts himself on an international stage and just continues to grow in stature. And what I, as he does, he also grounds himself in the struggle for human rights around the world, starting with the rights of African American people, this, then the rights of African people globally in their fight against colonialism, and then the fight of all peoples against colonialism and imperialism, and also connecting himself to the struggles of workers wherever they're at in the world. We talked about how as he grew and grew and grew in terms of his, 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 his stature and his popularity, the forces that were against him began to uh, take notice. They began to look at ways that they could silence Robeson. That's how we kind of ended class last week. And this week, we're going to pick up with that. We're going to, same question that we ended last, question, uh, last week on, but we're going to talk more about the repression primarily of the U.S. government, but not necessarily just the U.S. government. You also had British intelligence involved and, and other uh, forces. But the U.S. government's response to Robeson's struggle for freedom. Last week, we talked about what happened at the end of World War II and how Robeson continued his activism around the rights of workers, around the anti-colonial struggle, and his struggle for world peace. So we're going to talk about how the government responded to this. And then we're going to talk about how African people defended and responded to Robeson's struggle for freedom. Because it was the African masses at home and abroad that came to Robeson's defense, that supported Robeson when all the trouble started. 
And then we're going to talk about what we can take away from Robeson's legacy in 2023. What can we learn from this Giants example that we can put into place in the times that we live now? Because they're not dissimilar to what Robeson was going through uh, in the 1950s and 60s, which we'll talk about. All right, so we kind of left last class uh, off talking about the fallout from Robeson's statement at the 1949 Paris Peace Conference. Essentially, when he said that all African people wanted was peace and that there were struggles to be fought in the United States and in other places and that African people would not go to war against the Soviet Union, not because of any particular love for the Soviet Union, but because of a desire for peace. This statement was twisted by the press that basically made it out to seem as though Paul Robeson said black folks love the Soviet Union so much that they'll never go to war against it and that he loved the Soviet Union so much that you know he would not support American efforts in any battle against it. So the fallout was, was, was brutal from this. And, the U and because of this, uh, the US government increased their surveillance on Robeson, his family, and then they started to increase the suppression of Robeson as an artist. Um, I want to just play or have uh, uh, Daniel play Robeson's remarks during the same year of 1940. I know we're kind of going back a little bit, but going into the late 40s, into the early 50s is going to explain uh, 56. So Daniel, if you want mind playing that short clip of Robeson's remarks uh, from 1949. <laughs> This is what made him so dangerous. You could hear the applause from the crowd. So you have the most popular artist in the world at the time. There's no question about that. And we're going to see the levels of Robeson's popularity as a singer, as an actor. And he's making these statements. He's giving these speeches. He's writing these articles talking about freedom and saying African Americans are not going to fight anywhere around the world until we get our freedoms right here in the US. And he's also connected that to the anti-colonial struggle against uh, uh, imperialism in Africa as well. A year later, 1950, so actually a few months later, 1950, in one of the first ways the United States government attempted to limit Robeson's influence was canceling his passport, making it impossible for Robeson to travel to places outside of the US. So, this is completely illegal, by the way. But the State Department said the only reason that they would get, well, first they ordered Paul Robeson to su uh, surrender his passport, and he refused. So they canceled it. And the reason given, it would not be in the best interest of the United States for Paul Robeson to travel abroad. That, that's the short statement. That's all that the State Department said when Robeson and his lawyers asked, well, what, what is the rationale for doing this? This would start an eight-year saga of Robeson trying to get his passport back so that he could not only continue his activism, his talk of uh, workers' rights and anti-imperialism abroad, but also to make money as an artist, to support himself. Because as we're going to see, they not only did this to kind of stop Robeson from going to London, going to the Soviet Union, going to India, going to these places to give concerts and to work with people, but also venues and telling them if you allow Robeson to perform 
we are going to say that you are communist affiliated, that you are uh, anti-American, and we're going to put that in the press. And therefore, we're going to have people picketing your concert venue, or we're going to put you on a list of subversive activities. So a lot of concert venue owners around the, the country said, we can't have you perform here. Radio stations were required to not play Robeson's music, to not allow him to appear on their shows. Burgeoning television, he was supposed to appear on the show uh, done uh, on CBS, and they canceled his appearance. All of this to try to silence this man as an artist and as an activist. And we have to remember the time period. Again, it's 1949, it's the end of the Cold War. And we go back to this map. The reason why they were so afraid, and the re they're, they're not lying when they say this. It's just illegal for them to cancel a passport because of this. But they're not lying that it would not be in the best interest of the United States. And when they say the United States, they're talking about the ruling class of the United States, the capitalist class of the United States, the folks that run the United States government, the FBI, the State Department, the, whole, they, who, the folks that were uh, waging the Cold War against the Soviet Union. And we're now confronting a world where the masses of the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, were fighting against imperialism, and new countries were emerging, new giants like India, like an independent China that's now become uh, a, a communist country at this time. Africa, the independence movement is about to start. Egypt, Sudan will be independent in the early 50s. Ghana, uh, Guinea will be independent by the late 1950s. So all of these countries are emerging on the world scene at the end of World War II. And the United States is afraid, uh, the, the ruling class of the United States is afraid that if Rosen is able to travel and get his message out, that he's going to influence people to go more toward a socialist economy and a socialist way of doing things and a, uh, a way of doing things free of neocolonialism and imperialism that wouldn't be in the interest of the wealthy class of the United States. That's exploiting the resources and the land of the masses of the world. So this is what's happening in 1949. The State Department issued a statement, and this is actually coming from, and I'm going to put this pamphlet on our, our course website, a, when, once his uh, passport was canceled, a movement arose uh, to get his passport back and to put and lobby the U.S. government to happen, and the uh, pamphlet was released by Lloyd Brown, one of his associates, called Lift Every Voice for Paul Robeson, which outlined what the U.S. was trying to do to, to Paul Robeson and his response to it. So this pamphlet was released. And they quoted the State Department. And the State Department, in a more lengthy, uh, uh, this was actually during one of the appeals. So they cancel his passport. He goes and appeals his decision in the courts. And at first, the court ruled in favor of Robeson. One of the lower courts, I think in DC, ruled in favor of Robeson and said, no, this is illegal. You can't just cancel somebody's passport because you think their political views don't align with the US. You can't do that. But then the State Department appealed that decision to a district court. And then the district court ruled in favor of the State Department, saying, no, it, it's not in the US interest to have this man traveling. And the State Department used this rationale. They said, in view of the uh, appellant's frank admission that he has been for years extremely active politically on behalf of the independence of the colonial peoples of Africa, though this may be a highly laudable aim, the diplomatic embarrassment that, this, that could arise from the presence abroad of such a meddler traveling under the protection of an American passport is easily imaginable. So from the State Department's own mouth, they're saying we don't want, he's already said that he's against colonialism. Now, if we let him go to Africa and to go to India and to go to these places and to go to Europe, and this position is going against what the US's uh, position is, which is upholding uh, the British and the French at this time, so this is 1949, the British and the French uh, uh, possessions in Africa and in Asia, that would be going against what the U.S. and their allies want. So, and remember, Robeson's not a government official. Now, it'd be different if Robeson worked for the government and the government had a position and all the bureaucrats and the diplomats around the world are supposed to hold up for, to the U.S. government position. That's their job. He's a private citizen. He can have whatever positions he wants. But the State Department realized the power of this man. They knew what was coming. They knew African independence was going to come eventually. They knew that the anti-colonial movement was growing. And they didn't want Robeson influencing the masses of Africa and of Asia to make that process happen faster, to finally kick out the Europeans 
in the 1940s. The U.S. State Department was that worried about this one man's influence. They said, no, we, you can't travel. And they, they put it there. So, but they not only did that. So let's, let's, let's recap. So they canceled his passport. Can't travel outside uh, the United States. They tell concert venues. You can't have this man perform or we're going to put you on the, the subversive list. The radio stations won't play his music, his records. They won't allow him to come on to the radio to sing live. He can't go on television to sing. And then they used the black press, certain elements of it, because not all the black. A lot of the black press at the time were for Robeson. But the ones that they could get, the State Department and the FBI, when I say they, I'm talking about the State Department, the FBI, and then internationally, the CIA. They would use hand-picked Negroes, and I'm using that term <laughs> on purpose, to do their bidding. People like Roy Wilkins of the NAACP. He's one of the executive directors of the NAACP. Paul Robeson's son, and again, a lot of this information is coming out of these two texts uh, written by Paul Robeson's son. He's going to become really important when we get to the end of Paul Robeson's life and what happened. But this is where a lot of this information is coming from. Because he wasn't just Paul Robeson's son, but he also was an academic historian. He knew how to collect the historical information on this. So a lot of this stuff comes from uh, newly declassified FBI and CIA documents, which describe the tactics that they used against Paul Robeson and other uh, activists that were fighting at the time. A lot of this stuff is declassified now. Because the US is so bold now that they're like, we'll let this be out because we know you people aren't going to look at history anyway. You're not going to look at these documents. So we'll tell you exactly what we did, how we did it, and what happened. And then I won't tell everything. Some stuff is still redacted, but you can get these documents through the Freedom of Information Act. So a lot of this stuff was, was uncovered by Robeson's uh, son and others when he was writing this book about his father. One of the things that was found, one FBI, uh, no, State Department memorandum said, we can't let Robeson have influence in Africa. This is a big issue. And in fact, there was a diplomat that was stationed in the Gold Coast, what's now Ghana, but it was before Ghana got independence in the early 1950s. And he said, listen, you know, Nkrumah's running around. We got this big six in Ghana that are fighting for independence. We don't need Robeson, you know, influencing the African masses. So we need a document that can go all over Africa that will dissuade the middle class Africans, the ones that will lead the liberation movements, um, or that will put themselves at the head of the liberation movement, away from the influence of Paul Robeson. And so that was the memorandum. Then a couple of months later, some writer in the NAACP magazine, most, Paul Robeson's son thinks it was really Roy Wilkins, uh, but we don't know who this writer is because even in the, the, the article, it says Robert Allen is the pen name of a well-known New York journalist. Some pseudonym. So we don't know who wrote this, because the guy wouldn't even uh, put his name on his work. But this appeared in the crisis. This is the uh, publication of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, who Roy Wilkins and Walter White, at the time, the leadership in the NAACP, was very much in line with the foreign policy of the United States. They were extremely anti-communist. This is what led one of the founders of the NAACP, W.E.V. Du Bois, to leave the organization. Because he said, I don't like the direction that this is going in. But they write in the crisis, Paul Robeson, the lost shepherd. And they say, a few short years ago, Negro Americans were proud to point to Paul Robeson as another example of the fallacy of the white supremacy uh, myth. Uh, from concert platform, but from behind theater footlights, from speakers' rostrums, his voice served as a constant reminder of the heights to which his people have risen through their sheer ability. The Paul Robeson from whom Moscow today parades the, uh, before the world is not the same man. And all but a small handful of America's 15 million Negroes are quick to point out the difference. They see no similarity between Paul Robeson, American, who overcame the obstacles of discrimination to win world acclaim for his artistic accomplishments, and Paul Robeson, Moscow's number one Negro, who spouts communist propaganda as wildly as Vyshinsky. This smear campaign was a, an attempt to get the African intellectuals and other folks on the continent that were about to gear up in the independence movement to turn away from the influence of Robeson. It didn't work, by the way, because what people like Roy Wilkins and others didn't realize is 
Robeson had already gotten to the mind and hearts of African people around the world. You weren't going to turn them away from Paul Robeson just because uh, of, of hit pieces like this. And they saw the injustice of his passport being canceled. They saw his sincerity when he worked with working class people, when he sung for working class people, when he wrote, when he talked. So the masses weren't swayed. In fact, Paul Robeson Jr. writes of a very interesting exchange that happened um, in a bar in Harlem. So, you know, Robeson's back in New York at this time. And one of the players for the Brooklyn Dodgers, one of the newly integrated black baseball players named Don Newcomb, is in the bar and Robeson. Newcomb is brought into the Kool-Aid of the State Department and all that. So he sees Robeson, and Robeson goes to shake his hand, and the guy's like, uh, you're an anti-American, and I'm a veteran, and I fought wars against you. And he's like getting in Robeson's face. And you know, Robeson's a big man. He's not backing down. But all of a sudden, some of the patrons in the bar get between Robeson and, and Newcomb, and one of them has a knife. He's like, listen, if you mess with Paul, you mess with all of us in this bar. So I, I think it's best that you simmer down. So this is, this is the mentality of the, the masses of black people. They are in the corner of Paul Robeson. You're not going to be able to tell them who Robeson is because he's already shown through his life's example and everything that he's done that he's for the masses of black folks. So this didn't work. And then Robeson had his own newspaper, his own publication. So while all this is going on, Robeson's realizing that a lot of the avenues that he had previously relied upon to express his political ideas and also to get his artistry out were being dried up by this joint effort of the State Department, FBI, and the CIA to silence him. So he has his own newspaper. We talked about this last week called Freedom, which he publishes monthly um, between 1950 and I think all the way up to uh, 1959, uh, maybe even into the early 60s. But he writes a column every week. Um, you know, you see <laughs> memo to the NAACP leaders, it's time to fight, not fun, uh, because he's re reacting to what the leadership in the NAACP is doing to try to, you know, uh, uh, dissuade folks from uh, interacting with them. We already talked about last week how the U.S. Uh, collaborated with Canada in the early 1950s to keep him out of Canada, even though you didn't need a passport to go to Canada. You could just go back in the day, but they made it so that Robeson couldn't even go to Canada. So he gave that, that concert that we talked about last week right across the border where thousands of Canadians listened to Paul Robeson sing while he was on the American side of the border. So even with that attempt to keep him out, the masses were still saying, no, we want Robeson. And there's nothing that you're going to be able to do to dissuade us from him. The record labels refused to allow Robeson to record for them and to put out his records. So what did Paul Robeson do? He started his own record company called Othello Records. He picked that name from you know, the famous role that he played, Othello Records. And he, along with his son and his associate Lloyd Brown, uh, had started this record company, and he put out Robeson Sings. Store, record stores in the United States refused to carry his record. Record plant, he had to go to a special uh, 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 plant, you know, the place where they produced the, the records that was actually owned by a progressive that allowed him to actually print his records and, and to, to uh, you know, make the, uh, the record covers and all that. Because no, uh, the major plants wouldn't do anything, wouldn't touch his work. So he couldn't sell his work. If store owners were found um, selling the work, they'd be put on a list. It was even reported that government workers that had possession of Paul Robeson's albums were fired from their jobs. If you work for the federal government in D.C., and a lot of black folks did, if you were found trying to go to a Robeson concert or you had a Robeson album, you get fired from your job. This is the list that they went to try to silence this man and, and uh, uh, put him in, in the poorhouse so that he would disavow all his political activity. So he starts Othello Records. And the way that they got the records out, the way they distributed them, was through the mail. He sold thousands of records to people, mostly in the black community, but also a lot of progressive whites, through the mail. So they would call, I mean, they would, people would fill out their form, get the record, pay, and, and be shipped to their house. So he cut out the record stores, direct to consumer model. You know, this is something that a lot of artists later on in the 20th century would love, would, would love to do. This is what Prince had in his mind when he was fighting with his record company. People were like, why do I need the record companies? And Robeson showed in the 1950s that you don't need the record companies. If you have an audience, they'll find you, and you can sell, and you'll probably get a bigger piece of the pie, economically speaking, uh, when 
in terms of the how record companies work. But that's another discussion for another time. We should probably have a whole course on <laughs> the music industry. But anyway, he starts Othello Records and get, gets his own album out. In Freedom, he anticipates, and through his political writings and his speeches, like the one that you heard, he anticipates many of the same arguments that will be made by folks like Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., Muhammad Ali in the next decade, in the 60s and into the early 70s. By this time, 1954, the US is beginning to replace the French as the imperial power in Vietnam. The Vietnamese had fought valiantly to end French colonialism and what they called Indochina back then. The French had colonized that area. And as they're kicking the French out, the U.S. is looking at the situation and they're saying, we don't want another Korea. We don't want another situation where another Asian country, this is already after China, this is already after the Korean conflict, we don't want another Asian country to become socialist. This is all part of the Truman foreign, the Truman Doctrine, Truman Doctrine, this international foreign policy of the U.S. that we want to limit the spread of communism, of socialism. So as they see the Vietnamese uh, being led by Ho Chi Minh, emerging as the nationalist party that's going to lead the country to independence, they want to put an end to that. And they want their own puppets that will espouse capitalism, that will espouse U.S. foreign policy to be in charge in Vietnam. This is how the Vietnam conflict begins. Robeson sees this at the beginning of it. And he writes in Freedom, uh, shall Negro sharecroppers from Mississippi be, be sent to shoot down brown-skinned peasants in Vietnam to serve the interests of those who oppose Negro liberation at home and colonial freedom abroad? He even writes an article, Ho Chi Minh is Toussaint Leoverture of Indochina. So he has this international outlook. But this sentence that he writes should sound very familiar to those of you that followed the career of Muhammad Ali. Because when they asked Ali, are you going to go to Vietnam to fight? And this is... Ali is an example of Robeson. I mean, he is the next generation Robeson, great athlete, great speaker, who, because of his political beliefs and his desire for peace and not to go fight in Vietnam, was stripped of his title, was uh, incarcerated, threatened with incarceration, all these things for avoiding the draft. But when Ali was asked, he said, why would I go to Vietnam? The Vietnamese never called me nigger. You want a brown man to go fight, <laughs> you want a black man to go fight brown men on behalf of white men. That, that doesn't make sense. Robeson is saying the same thing back in 1954. Why would Negro sharecroppers go fight brown-skinned people and they can't even get justice right here in the United States? So this is, this is the type of writing and the type of rhetoric that Robeson was, was uh, espousing, which made him incredibly dangerous to the ruling class in the US. So finally, in another attempt to discredit Robeson in the eyes of Americans, the Congress subpoenas Robeson to come and to testify in the House Committee on Un-American Activities. This is where the vestiges of the McCarthy era would continue their search to discredit Americans and to put them, label them as subversives and members of the Communist Party. So they would bring you here, they would make you testify, have you or have you ever been associated with the Communist Party or that type of thing. Um, and Robeson gives one of the most cited and significant testimonies uh, in, recorded during this whole era of the communist witch hunts. We don't have the actual recording of what Robeson uh, said. We, have the, we don't have the audio recording. We have the, the, the transcript. The transcript of this exchange was actually recreated by James Earl Jones and some other actors. And I want to just play, uh, I want Daniel to play the testimonies. We're going to listen to Robeson's testimony, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a break and we'll talk about uh, what we uh, have learned so far. Uh, so Daniel, if you wouldn't mind playing that. Are you now a member of the Communist Party? Oh, please, please, please. Is that the way, Mr. Robeson? What is the Communist Party? What do you mean by that? Are you now a member of the Communist Party? Would you like Party? to come to the ballot box? when I vote and take off the ballot and see? Mr. Chairman, I respect you suggest the witness be directed to answer the question. You are directed to answer the question. I invoke the Fifth Amendment and forget it. I respectfully suggest the witness be directed to answer the question whether, if he gave us a truthful answer, he would be supplying information which might be used against him in a criminal proceeding. You are directed to answer, Mr. Gentlemen, Logan. 
the first place, wherever I've been in the world, the first to die in the struggle against fascism were the communists. I laid many wreaths upon the graves of communists. That is not criminal. Chief Justice Warren has been very clear that the Fifth Amendment does not have anything to do with the influence of criminality. And I invoke the Fifth Amendment. Have you ever been known under the name of John Thomas? Oh, please. Does somebody here want me to put up for perjury someplace? John Thomas, my name is Paul Wilson. And anything I have to say, I have said in public all over the world, and that is why I'm here today. Mr. Chairman, I ask that you direct the witness to answer the question he's making his speech. I ask you to affirm or deny the fact that your Communist Party name was I John Thomas. The Fifth Amendment. This is really ridiculous. The witness talks very loud when he makes a speech, but when he invokes the Fifth Amendment, I can't hear him. I have medals for diction. I can talk any loud. Will you talk a little louder? I invoke the Fifth Amendment loudly. Sir, who are Mr. and Mrs. Latimer? I invoke York? the Fifth Amendment. Do you know a Manning Johnson? I invoke the Fifth Amendment. Do you know Gregory Kaifitz? I invoke the Fifth Amendment. Do you know a Max Jurgen? I invoke the Fifth Amendment. Max Jurgen. Why don't you have these people here to be cross-examined? Could I ask whether this is legal? This is not only legal, but usual. By unanimous vote, this committee has been instructed to perform this very distasteful task. To whom am I talking? You're speaking as the chairman of the committee. To Mr. Walter? Yes. The Pennsylvania Walter? That is right. Representative of the steel workers? That is right. And the coal mining workers? That is right. Not United States steel, by any chance, of great patriots? That is right. You are the author of the bills that are going to keep all kinds of decent people out of the country. No, only your kind. Colored people like myself? and you would let in the Teutonic Anglo-Saxon stock. We are trying to make it easier to get rid of your kind, too. You don't want any colored people to come in. Could I be allowed to read from my statement? Will you just tell this committee, please, while under oath, Mr. Robeson, the communists who participated in the preparation of that statement? Oh, please. The reason I'm here today, from the mouth of the State Department itself, is I should not be allowed to travel because I have struggled for the independence of the colonial peoples of Africa. The other reason I'm here today, again, from the State Department and from the record of the Court of Appeals, is that when I am abroad, I speak out against injustices against the Negro people in this land. That is why I'm here. I'm not being tried for what I'm a communist. I'm being tried for fighting for the rights of my people. We are still second-class citizens in this country, in this United States of America. My mother was born in your state, and my mother was a Quaker. My ancestors in the time of Washington baked bread for George Washington's troops when they crossed Delaware. My father was a slave. I stand here struggling for the rights of my people to be full citizens in this country. And we are not. We are not in Mississippi. We are not in Montgomery, Alabama. They're not in Washington. They are nowhere. And that is why I'm here today. You want to shut up every Negro who has the courage to stand up and fight for the rights of his people, for the rights of workers. And I have been on many a picket line for the steel workers, too. And that is why I'm here today. Would you tell us whether or not you know Thomas W. Young? I the Fifth Amendment. Thomas W. Young is a Negro president of the Guide Publishing Company. I'd like to read you his testimony, quote, Paul Robeson has no moral right to place in jeopardy the welfare of the American Negro to advance a foreign cause. In the eyes of the Negro people, this false prophet is unfaithful to their country, and they repudiate him, close quote. Do you know the man that said that? I invoke the Fifth Amendment now. Can I read my statement? It is a sad and bitter country. While you were in Paris in 1949, Mr. Robeson, did you tell an audience the American Negro would never go to war against the Soviet Union? May I say that is slightly out of context. May I explain to you what I did say? I remember the speech very well. 2,000 students who came from populations that would range to six or 700 million people asked me to say in their name that they did not want war. No part of my speech in Paris says 15 million American Negroes would do anything. I said it was my feeling that the American people would struggle for peace. And that has been since underscored by the President of these United States. Now in passing, 
I said, Do you know any people who want war? Listen to me. I said it was undutiful to me that any people could take up arms in the name of a man like Senator Eastman of Mississippi against anybody. Gentlemen, I still say that. This United States government should go to Mississippi and protect my people. That is what it should be. I lay before you, sir, an article. Quote, I am looking for full freedom, unquote, by Paul Robeson in The Worker. July 3rd, 1949, quote, I said it was unthinkable that the Negro people of America or elsewhere could be drawn into war with the Soviet Union. I repeat it with a hundredfold emphasis, they will not, close quote. And gentlemen, they have not. It is clear that no Americans are going to go to war with the Soviet Union. While you were in Stockholm, did you make a little speech? I made all kinds of speeches. Let me read you a quote. Let me listen. Do so, please. I am a lawyer. It would be a revelation if you would listen to counsel. In good company, I usually listen. But you know, people wander around in such fancy places. You said, Mr. Robson, and I quote, I belong to the American resistance movement, which fights against American imperialism, just as the resistance movement fought against Hitler. Just like those that were Douglas and Harriet Tubman were underground railroaders and fighting for our freedom, you bet your life. I have to insist that you listen to these questions. I am listening. I quote further, why should the Negroes ever fight against the only nation in the world where racial discrimination discrimination is prohibited, and where the people can live freely, never. They will never fight against either the Soviet Union or the people's democracies, close quote. Did you make that statement? I do not remember, but what is perfectly clear today is that 900 million people, other colored people, have told you they will not. 400 million in India and millions everywhere have told you that. Mrs. Answer the question. He doesn't need to make a speech. Did you write an article that was published in the USSR Information Bulletin? Yes. Quote, I want to emphasize that only here in the Soviet Union did I feel that I was a real man with a capital M. Close quote. I would say... What is your name? Aaron. I am quite willing to answer the question. When I was a singer years ago, and this, this you have to listen to. I am listening. I am a bass singer, so for me, it was Charlie Uppen, the great Russian bass, not Caruso the tenor. I learned the Russian language to sing their songs. I wish you would listen now. Mr. Chairman, I ask you to direct the witness to answer the question. Just be fair with I ask for order. The great poet of Russia is of African blood. Well, if not, go to the It is your strength, this. Did you make that statement? When I first went to Russia in 1934. Did you make that statement? When I first went to Russia in did 1934. Did you make that statement? In Russia, I thought for the first time like a full human being. No color prejudice like in Mississippi. No color prejudice like in Washington. It was the first time I felt like a human being. Where I did not feel the pressure of color as I feel it in this community today. Why do you not stay in Russia? Because my father was a slave. And my people died to build this country. And I'm going to stay here and have a part of it just like you. And no fascist-minded people will drive me from it. Is that clear? You are here because you are promoting the communist cause. I am here because I am opposing the neo-fascist cause, which I see arising in these committees. Jefferson could be sitting here. And Frederick Douglass could be sitting here. Eugene Debs could be sitting here. Now, what prejudice are you talking about? You were graduated from Rutgers. You were graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. I remember seeing you play football at Lehigh. There was no prejudice against you. Just a moment. This is something I challenge very deeply, that the success of a few Negroes can make up for $700 a year for thousands of Negro families in the South. My father was a slave, and I had cousins who are sharecroppers. I do not see success in terms of myself. I have sacrificed hundreds of thousands of dollars for what I believe in. While you were in Moscow, Mr. Robeson, did you make a speech lauding Stalin? I can't remember. Have you recently changed what your mind happened about Stalin? Stalin, gentlemen, is a question for the Soviet Union, and I won't argue with a representative of the people who, in building America, wasted the lives of my people. You are responsible, you and your forebears, for 60 to 100 million black people dying 
in the slave ships and on the plantations. Don't you ask me about anybody. I'm please. sure you wouldn't want to discuss with us the slave labor camps in the Nothing Soviet Union. More on slavery than this society, I assure you. I would invite your attention to the Daily Worker of June 29, 1949, with reference to a get-together with you and Ben Davis, formerly communist councilman in New York. Do you know Ben One Davis? Of my dearest friends, he is as patriotic an American as can be, and you gentlemen are the non-patriots. Just a minute. You are the un-Americans. The hearing is now adjourned. I think it should be. I've endured all of this that I can. Can I read my statement? No! The meeting is adjourned. It should be. I was talking, but I wasn't on. Thank you, Daniel, for that. Uh, we can open it up now for any questions or comments that uh, folks may have as we get to our first uh, uh, break. Uh, Mr. Thomas, go ahead. Good morning, all. It's amazing that we're talking about 1949 in the late 60s. We did the same thing for Cassius Clay. And the Americans let us not to believe in cynicism. However, when we speak and stand up to speak like Robson did, we talk about the rule of law. Whose rule of law? What rule of law? If you listen to that, that uh, hearing and talk about the rule of law, whose rule of law? Who, does it, who is it subjugated to? And it hasn't changed yet because we just had the George Floyd situation. So, and it goes on and on. So America has not learned anything. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Uh, other folks, you can raise your hand. You can put it in the chat. Uh, Robin, go ahead. I know you got something. Indeed, indeed. Um, I can't help but see the, the similarities between uh, uh, Robeson and uh, Desmond Cole mm. in terms of uh, so Robeson's being attacked uh, by white folks because he's criticizing the like the white power structure. Uh, Desmond is attacked by uh, well, white folks and, and black folks because he criti critiques black leaders, right? And in fact, that the that hit piece, that Royal, Winkin, Royal Roy Wilkins hit piece on Robeson is very much like the hit piece that uh, Roy St. James, a black guy, did in the Toronto Star. Actually, it's supported by the, the Star. I was it was a two-page hit piece on on Desmond about how the all oh, black folks don't like what De Desmond's doing. Right? So. Um, very similarities, and, sim and similar also in terms of that, that uh, partly as a result of, of the way Desmond has spoke uh, against, well, all the wh white system, b b bl black folks supporting it. Uh, he also has never gotten like a, a permanent job in, in, in journalism, and that's a, so similar to, to Robeson, right? So. Yeah, all the forces that could be marshaled against someone, whether it's the media, economic pressures, all of these things. And, and toward the end of this class, we'll talk about the ultimate a uh, weapon that was used against Robeson. Um, but these things aren't, th this is a lesson that we should learn. Um, and how it's not, it's not conspiracy theory oftentimes. And we talk about that voices that are fighting for freedom, all of the tools that are used to silence them. It's not conspiracy theory. And um, this shows. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into more about that in a second. Any other questions or hands? I don't see any uh, or comments. I don't see any. We'll keep going then if there's nothing else. All right, so let's, let's keep it going. So after 1956, and he gives this statement, um, you know, the black press, again, the white press, one second. All right, the white press, used his testimony as, again, another example of, uh, see, he is aligned with the communists. He wouldn't answer the question. He's taking the Fifth Amendment and all that. The black press applauded Robeson. Again, that whole, what, what you just mentioned, Roy Wilkins and others, and even who they brought up in the testimony that, oh, this person says that you don't speak for Negroes. The black press and its readers applauded Robeson for his position. We can see this. Uh, uh, front page from the Baltimore Afro-American, what Robeson said, uh, I want protection for my people. We agree with Mr. Robeson uh, that its members could be more profitably uh, spent 
could more profitably spend their time passing civil rights measures and bringing in for questioning such un-American elements as those white supremacists and manifesto singers who have pledged themselves to defy and evade every constitution they had previously sworn to uphold and maintain. We are not communists, nor do we follow the communist line. Moreover, we do approve of some of the activities and statements attributed uh, we do not approve, excuse me, of some of the activities and statements attributed to Mr. Rosen. But we do contend that if Mr. Eastland and Mr. Walters, these are white supremacists from the South, by the way, uh, are members of the White Citizens Councils are entitled to freedom of speech, so is Mr. Rosen. The First Amendment as well as the Fifth Amendment should apply with equal force to everybody, which goes to what Mr. Thomas was alluding to, that idea of rule of law. So you see, the black masses, the black press, throughout, despite all the efforts of the State Department, the FBI, the CIA, to isolate Robeson, to separate him from the black community, it failed. Um, in 1958, Robeson published it as a result of this, Here I Stand. And this is a book that, again, if you want to understand the political ideas of Robeson in detail, it's Here I Stand. He talks a little bit about his early life in this book, but he really gets into, into his political ideas in the, early, in the late 1950s. And this was a reflection after his experience in the, um, the Un-American uh, uh, testimony, the Committee on Un-American Activities testimony and all that. Uh, he writes about this and everything that was done to him up to this point. And he makes some profound political statements in this book. Again, statements that would be echoed not long after, seven years, ten years after, by people like Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr. and others. He says in 1958, because he's seeing the beginnings of the Civil Rights Movement. So by the time we get to 1958, Brown versus Board of Education has passed, which has made legal segregation unconstitutional. The Montgomery bus boycott has begun a year after that. Rosa Parks not giving up her seat. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. coming on the scene as, as the young leader of the Montgomery Improvement Association. Um, Emmett Till has been killed in 1955 as well. So the civil rights movement, with all of these uh, various impetuses, is emerging. So Robeson is, is actively engaged in writing about the civil rights movement, but in order for the movement to survive, he purpose, purposefully distances, distances himself from a lot of the leaders out for, for strategic measures. You won't see pictures of Robeson with Martin Luther King Jr. You won't see pictures of Robeson with certain other figures because he told them, like, listen, I support everything you're doing. I'm going to use my articles and freedom to write about what's going on and to talk about it. But I don't want you too closely associated with me because then they will attack you and it could stunt the movement. So this is, he made a strategic uh, position to stay a little bit away. But he writes in his book, I'm not suggesting, of course, that the Negro people uh, should take law enforcement into their own hands. But we have the right, and above all, we have the duty to bring the strength and support of our entire community to defend the lives and property of each individual family. Indeed, the law itself will move a hundred times quicker whenever it is apparent that the power of our numbers has been called forth. The time has come for the great Negro communities throughout the land, Chicago, Detroit, New York, Birmingham, and all the rest, to demonstrate that they will no longer tolerate mob violence against one of their own. Enlisting the inevitable and inalienable rights of man, Thomas Jefferson put life before liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And it must be clear that for Negro Americans today, the issue of personal security must be first and resolved first before all other matters are attended to. When the Negro is told that he must stay in his place, quote unquote, there is always the implicit threat that unless he does so, mob violence will be used against him. Hence, as I see it, nothing is more important than to establish the fact that we will no longer suffer the use of mobs against us. What he's calling for is self-defense. Again, this is something that's going to be echoed by Malcolm a few years later. He's, on, he's anticipating these things. He writes about where the black community is politically. Very important statement in 1958. He says, we are divided in many ways, in politics, in religious affiliations, in economic and social classes. And in addition to these group rivalries, there are the obstacles of personal ambitions and jealousies of various leaders. But as I move among our people these days, from New York to California, I sense a growing impatience with 
petty ways of thinking and doing things. I see a rising resentment against control of our affairs by white people, regardless of whether that domination is expressed by the blunt orders of political bosses or more discreetly by the quote unquote advice of white liberals, which must be heeded or else. There is a rapidly growing awareness that despite all of our differences, it is necessary that we become unified. And I think that the force of that idea will overcome all barriers. Coordinated action will not, of course, come all at once. It will develop in the grassroots and spread from community to community. And the building of that unity is a task which each of us can undertake wherever we are. Again, ideas that are going to be uh, espoused by people like Ella Baker, people like Malcolm X, when he uh, leaves the Nation of Islam and he starts talking about building a black united front, putting our political differences aside, our religious differences aside. King talks about this. Basically, a decade later, when King writes, where do we go from here, Community of Chaos, he espouses these same ideas. This is what made Robeson so dangerous to the establishment. Because not only did he have these ideas, but because of his artistry, because of who he was, he was able to get this out to millions of people. They would have followed Robeson, not just in the United States, but around the world. And he had the same ideas, again, that King would have, which made King dangerous, that Malcolm would have, which made Malcolm dangerous, which is why those two men were assassinated. And we have to constantly read these works when I talk about Robeson first, again, as we started the class, most people don't even know about Robeson. That's why we had the whole class about him. But even those that do, they might know he was a great actor, a great athlete, a great singer, and they leave it at that. But then they don't read his work. So I'm encouraging all of you to read Here I Stand because much of what he writes in 1958 applies in 2023. This statement applies more than ever about the need for unity, the need not to be controlled by outsiders, whether they be white political bosses, or white liberals that seek to control black organizations. So we have to heed that. Then he talked about what does it mean to be a leader in the black community. Very important statement on leadership. He said, we should broaden our conception of leadership and see to it that all sections of Negro life are represented on the highest levels. There must be room at the top for people from down below. I'm talking about the majority of our folks who work in factory and field. They bring with them that down-to-earth view, which is the highest vision. And they can hammer and plow in more ways than one. Yes, we need more of them in leadership, and we need more of them in a hurry. We need more of our women in higher ranks, too. And who should know better than the children of Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, and Mary Church Terrell that our women folk have often led the way? Negro womanhood today is giving us many inspiring examples of steadfast devotion, cool courage under fire, and brilliant generalship in our people's struggles. And here is a major source for our new strength and militancy in Negro leadership on every level, 1958. is again, ideas are gonna be espoused by Ella Baker and others who were the, the organizers in the civil rights movement, by the sisters that would come along a decade later in the burgeoning black power movement that were arguing for the place of women in leadership and struggle and the place of the black masses, the African masses in the struggle, working class folks as the leadership. So this is what he's saying. And this book, just like this record, he published this book on his own because no major publisher would publish it. So he had a fellow book publishing. He had a fellow records and he had a fellow associates that published the book. The book wouldn't be placed in bookstores. The traditional bookstores wouldn't hold this book. So it was the black bookstores and the progressive white bookstores that uh, uh, you know, sold the book. And it sold well. It sold well among millions of black folks and progressive whites that bought this book. So again, when they tried to shut the doors, when they tried to say, we're not going to let your message get out, it got out because the people wanted to hear from Robeson. And Robeson created avenues through his book publishing company and through his record company to get his message out without being controlled by somebody else. Very important lessons for us in 2023. Um, I love this text. And again, I encourage everyone uh, to, to read it. Um, and again, we always, always have to mention when we talk about Robeson, the, the influence of his wife is Londa. I know I've been, been talking about her too much. But she's always here. She's his partner in all of this. She's a scholar in her own right. She's a traveler in her own right. She's been to Africa and India and, of course, the Soviet Union. And she's writing. And she's uh, uh, working politically. And she's engaged in all these struggles right alongside, right alongside Paul. And also his son. His son is 
openly a communist and, 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 and is an organizer and an activist in his own right. So the entire family is on the right side of history and the right side of the struggle. Although by the time we get to the late 1950s into the early 1960s, as Londa Robeson is suffering from her own health problems, uh, which is going to come into play in a second. Uh, but they're getting up there in age, and by the time we get to 1958, Paul Robeson is 60 years old. And when we get to the 60-year-old, uh, the, on the dawn of his 60 uh, years, folks around the world want to celebrate his 60th birthday. So he still hasn't had his passport re uh, renewed yet. So by the time we get to 1958, the State Department is going crazy because they're trying to contain all of these worldwide celebrations for Robeson. In India, because of his support for the anti-colonial movement against the British, the Prime Minister of India, Nehru, had, who's a friend of Robeson's, and, and you know, they corresponded. They planned in India, in many of the major cities in India, celebrations of his 60th birthday. The State Department is like, how is this possible? You know, India is the second most populous country in the world. So millions of people are going to be celebrating this man who we've denied his passport and he can't even travel. But these people are going to hold these celebrations. In the Soviet Union, they're going to be celebrating Robeson's 60th birthday with celebrations and concerts and, the, and these things. In China, they're going to be celebrating Robeson's 60th birthday. And of course, in the black communities around. So the State Department is losing its mind that in three of the most populous countries in the world, China, India, the Soviet Union, are going to have major celebrations for this man who they have attempted to isolate. So all their attempts of stopping his, his, his uh, ability to perform live, stopping his records from being sold, his book from being sold, all of this is, is for naught because still he's the most popular artist in the world. There's no question about that. And he's using his political, uh, his platform for these types of politics. Um, one of the, um, by the time we get to 1958, uh, Carnegie Hall has to buck the trend, and they actually book Robeson to perform in you know major concert space in New York. His concert is sold out; that they have to have another performance. So it goes to show, the people never turn their back on Robeson, no matter what these folks did. His concerts would still sell out. Now, I don't know, even today, in 2023, how many 60-year-old artists that are still performing are selling out things like this. I, I don't know. Who's, who's still out there that's, that's hot at 60? Maybe Stevie Wonder could do it. <laughs> He's well over 60. But uh, Madonna's like 60 now, 63 or 5, probably. Madonna might be able to do it. I don't know. But the, the Rolling Stones are like in their <laughs> 80s. But this is just one man. And he's still, with all of these things against him, and he's still selling out places. One thing closer to home for me when I read about Robeson, I found this out. Uh, and anybody watching this from Pittsburgh, my mother usually watches the, these, these recordings, so my mother will laugh at this. But in Pittsburgh, he was scheduled uh, to, to perform at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall in Pittsburgh. Now, those of you from Pittsburgh, this place is one of the major venues in Pittsburgh. It's whenever there's a graduation for the University of Pittsburgh or high school graduations, they're all in Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall. It's in Oakland and Pittsburgh. And they refused. Uh, there were protests and things. I said, no, you can't perform here. We're not going to allow you to perform here. He ends up performing at Central Baptist Church in, in Pittsburgh. Again, another sold out uh, uh, night, evening with Paul Robeson. Thousands of people went to see him. This I, is just one of the examples of how Whenever these venues and things would close themselves to Robeson, the black community, the churches, the Masonic lodges, the fraternities, the sororities, they would be there to say, hey, don't worry about it. We will have open up the venue for you. You're never going to starve. You might not be making 100000 and millions of dollars you would if you had sold out, but we're going to make sure that you're taken care of, that you're able to live your life as both an artist as an activist. The community supported him, the churches, all these uh, different formations because the masses never turned their back on Robeson. They were proud of him. So all this is happening. By the time we get to 1959, the Supreme Court, his case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And this was, you know, the, this should have been at the Supreme Court, but it, uh, an earlier court had refused uh, his hearing, his appeal, but then it finally got to uh, the court and had a 5-4 decision. So it wasn't even a unanimous decision. It was a 5-4 decision. And I was thinking about it this morning as, as I was preparing for class that I want to read the dissents, the people, the, the justices that voted against this. But 
his passport, uh, what the State Department did against his passport was unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court ruled it was unconstitutional. So his passport was revalidated in 1959. So you see him with his new passport. And now he's ready to go and pick up where he left off and start going around the world and singing and performing and most importantly, organizing and spreading a political message of peace, of workers' rights, of anti-imperialism, and also fighting to magnify the struggle of African Americans inside the US. So he does that. He goes to London. He goes to the Soviet Union. He gets his picture taken with Khrushchev. And again, the white press puts this picture out, and they're like, ah, see, see, he's a communist. He's with the premier of the Soviet Union. He's doing all this. Black press put the same picture out saying, look at how popular Paul Robeson is, that he gets to meet the premier. You don't see a picture of him with President Eisenhower. You see a picture of him with the president of the Soviet Union. So the black press is saying this is an example of how popular and proud we are that Paul Robeson is moving in these circles with these world leaders, whereas the white press is saying this guy's a communist. Look at him interacting with our enemy number one. So you see the different perceptions. So he's, he's organizing. He's, he's mobilizing. He's in 1961, so he's traveling throughout Europe, the Soviet Union. He goes to China, which he really wasn't supposed to do. Americans weren't supposed to go to China, but he goes and performs in China. Um, and by the time we get to 1961, he has plans to make a tour of Africa, and he's also invited by Fidel Castro of Cuba to come to Cuba to perform. Now, this is at the height of the anti-Cuban uh, the U.S.-Cuban relations being at an all-time low. This is right before the Bay of Pigs operation. This is a, when the U.S. is going to take Cuban exiles, train them to try to reinvade Cuba, and they're soundly defeated by the Cuban people. Um, but that happens a little while after Paul is in the Soviet Union in 1961. And this is right before the Cuban Missile Crisis as well, where the world was almost at the brink of <laughs> a nuclear destruction when the, the Soviets uh, put missiles in Cuba and, you know, all that was going on. So this is very dangerous times. This is where our story gets very uh, unfortunate, what happens in the Soviet Union in 1961. Paul Robeson is there. You see him there. He gets a, a, a presentation from some students in, in the Soviet Union. They present him with the, uh, an award named after Patrice Lumumba, the leader in the Congo that was just assassinated a few months earlier. Um, and when he's there in the Soviet Union in 1961, some strange things happen. There's a party at Paul Robeson's suite where he's staying in the Soviet Union. And according to his son, you can read about this in the book, the party was with a whole bunch of people that are asking very weird questions to Robeson, like, oh, can you help me get my family out of uh, prison in the Soviet Union, all these things. People that are very anti, seem, seemingly very anti-Soviet in the Soviet Union. Um, and again, from the perception of Robeson's son, Paul Robeson didn't like to you know, party with a whole bunch of people that he didn't know. You know that's not, that wasn't his thing. So eventually what happens is he get, Paul Robeson's son gets a call from his mother uh, a few days later, which basically says, you need to come to the Soviet Union immediately. Uh, Paul's in the hospital. Your father was found in his hotel room disoriented, and his wrists were slit as if he was making a suicide attempt. And his son is like, what? Like, it, didn't, it didn't make sense. As much as it doesn't make sense to you all hearing this, right? it's just a shock. That's how it was to his son. So he goes to the Soviet Union, and the doctors tell him and his mother that he's had basically this nervous breakdown, suicide attempt, you know, all this. He's looking very disoriented. Immediately, his son thinks he must have been drugged. There's no, my father doesn't have a history of anxiety or mental health disorders, nothing like that. Why would he be suicidal? He just got his passport back. He's making these plans to go to Cuba, to go to Africa. Why would he, why would, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. But he's in this state. Um, and his wife is not in the best health either. So the doctors are telling him, and the wife, as Londa makes a, a comment, she says, well, if we, we take him for treatment in London or the U.S., the Soviet doctors are saying, don't take him to London. Take him to the U.S. It's better that he's in a place that he's familiar with, um, and you know he'll recover much better. Um, and then she also makes a statement, well, what type of treatment course should we take to get him back to where he needs to be? You know, should electroshock treatment, which is something they would do, they thought was a mental health 
treatment back in the day. And the Soviet doctors said this, and Paul Robeson's son was there when the doctor said it. Under no circumstances in his condition should he be given electroshock treatment under no circuit. That would be completely inhumane for that to happen. As they're making preparations for what, what they're going to do next, to take him to London or the U.S., while he's in Moscow, Paul Jr. is asking questions, like, who was at this party? What went down? You know, I don't think that this, it doesn't make sense for this to happen. The Soviet Union, the Soviet officials tell him, you know, don't ask too many questions about this. And what Paul Robeson Jr. kind of deduces in his mind is that he didn't think the Soviets set his father up because they would really have no reason to do so. But he did feel as though the Soviet officials were embarrassed because they did believe something happened to him, but they didn't have the security detail in place to prevent it from happening. And so in order for that not to get out, that they had a blunder with security, that they didn't want Paul Robeson Jr. to inquire very much more into what was going on. And during that same time, he has an experience where he goes through this, 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 this manic stage. He's kind of, you know, lose, he doesn't understand what goes on. He ends up waking up in the hospital. Come to find out, he consults with somebody and he says, yeah, it seems like you're suffering from the effects of somebody that was you know, dosed with LSD. Because you don't have a history of, of mental illness or anything like that. So why? This is, so this is the same time. It's like a week after what happened to his father. So he deduced that he was drugged. So he's thinking my, something must have happened to my father. But because the Soviet officials said they don't don't delve too well into this, and he was in the Soviet Union, so it could have been you know a, uh, a threat on his life or something. He didn't delve too far into it. This is 1958 when this when, uh, excuse me 1961 when this happens. Because of the state that he's in, he can't take his father with him. So his mother is put in charge of his father's care. And in conflict with what the doctor says, she takes him back to London. For some reason, it's not really clear why. He goes to this hospital in London to get treated. And so he's, had, he's at this point where he's having these good days and he's having these bad days. And it's all after this one incident. He goes to the, to the hospital in London, and it's basically like a nursing home. And exactly what the Soviets said don't do is what those doctors did. They put him on heavy drugs and electric shock treatment for about two years. He's given this treatment. He is, as, again, there's sometimes where he's completely coherent. He's nothing. Then we'd have these these episodes, and then they would take him to the the hospital and and give him more heavy drugs and and uh, the electric shock treatment. In 1998, so fast forward. So Paul Robeson passed in 1976. We'll get back to that. Paul Robeson's son, while all this is going on, he's he's thoroughly convinced that something happened to his father, but. He, he was told by the Soviets to drop it. But being a historian, being an academic that he is, he, and with the Freedom of Information Act, he goes into the CIA records, the State Department records, and he finds all of these memorandums dealing with his father's health. C FBI records, CIA records, State Department records that are monitoring him from the surveillance and that are all alluding to the fact that they did something to his father during this time period, because they have all these extensive records where they're paying incredibly close attention to his health and what he's doing, what he's able to do, and if the drugs are working or not, and all these things in these, in these uh, declassified records. So I, I want to just let you hear an interview. There's no visual for this, but it's an audio interview from Democracy Now! between Paul Robeson's son. He passed away in, I think, I want to say 2006, 2004. No, maybe it's either 2016 or 2014, something like that. But Thorosen Jr. has since passed away. But this is an interview where he talked about what he found out concerning uh, his father's health at this period of his life. So, Daniel, if you wouldn't mind playing that. Jamal, that's a great show, man. Yeah. Well, today on Democracy Now!, uh, as we move on to our next segment, we're going to bring in part two of our discussion with Paul Robeson Jr., son of the singer, actor, and activist Paul Robeson. 
forbesson jr now believes that the central intelligence agency was involved with drugging his father with a mind altering drug perhaps p c in the nineteen fifty s in the midst of the cold war the central intelligence agency developed a top secret psychological warfare program called and k ultra after the second world war the western intelligence community became interested in the use of mind control drugs when it was learned that nazi scientists engaged in similar experimentation described as the cia's version of the manhattan project and k ultra was developed in response to rumors that the soviets plan to plant brainwashed assassins in the white house and other citadels of western power well last week and democracy now paul robeson jr spoke about a doctor that treated his father who had links to u.s intelligence and british intelligence paul robeson jr joined us again today uh... to continue the discussion we'll also talk with an expert in psychological warfare who can shed light on the possible role that u.s and british intelligence may have played in the drugging of paul robeson senior welcome to democracy now paul robeson nice to be here well for listeners who perhaps missed thursday's democracy now and i encourage people to go to the web for that show or any democracy now and if you miss it you can simply go to www dot pacifica dot o r g and click on any democracy now but can you summarize what happened to your father in the early nineteen sixties in moscow which uh... basically you feel was the evidence that your father was uh... drugged well there's a context and uh... a series of sets of evidences in in various uh, places uh, the first is moscow nineteen sixty one the context was that uh, my father decided to violate his passport regulations visit china uh, return to the U.S. to join the civil rights movement, which was burgeoning. And on the way, he intended to visit Fidel Castro in Cuba. Um, he had been invited by Fidel Castro. I know the details of that because I was the contact for the Cubans in the U.S. and was part of the uh, arrangements. Uh, I and <clears throat> excuse me, I and my father were both so the Cubans very much concerned with security problem so there would be no leak about his specific uh, travel plans. This was right before the Bay of Pigs and Yes, um, it, it, so that um, he being in London uh, decided to just pull up stakes suddenly, get to Moscow and make his plans to go to China and he wanted to go by the way to Africa and India as well but his main targets were to go to China and then to Cuba and then home. Um, he felt security-wise, obviously, Moscow was a much better place to make those arrangements than London, where he felt that U.S. and British intelligence would be all over him. From Freedom of Information Act documents I've obtained, uh, they were. Apparently, there was a leak in London, and the CIA, through the FBI, attaché, legal attaché in London, did find out his travel plans. Uh, since the Bay of Pigs was scheduled for April 17th and he departed from Moscow on March 23rd, there was kind of a panic in the CIA to help him the documents. There was, of course, a motive for them to neutralize him in Moscow so he wouldn't go to Cuba and be there when the Bay of Pigs invasion occurred. So that's the context. Uh, he went to Moscow. Uh, if you saw the two-hour feature documentary that was aired on American Masters on uh, February 24th. That's PBS. PBS, right. Um, he was quite active uh, from March 23rd on. I mean, he appeared uh, at meetings, he sang, he spoke. Uh, there was no trace of any depression or any problem. But suddenly on the night of March 26th, in the context of a uh, unscheduled and suspicious wild party in his quarters, which he locked himself away from in an inner room, uh, he was discovered the next morning with his wrists slashed. So uh, my suspicion was that he was drugged at the party with probably LSD, because he hallucinated immensely, and in a day and a half he was more or less back to normal, which is the symptoms of the LSD rather than BZ. Um, his description of the party, there were a lot of suspicious kind of people there, meaning anti-Soviet people who were talking about, would you help me get my 
relatives out of the gulag, things like that. Very disconnected, not normal for, but here's a distinguished visitor, Paul Robeson in Moscow, and these people around in the party. Anyway, uh, long story short, <clears throat> excuse me, I made my own investigation. I was uh, fluent and still am in Russian, had a lot of contacts there. Um, the Russian officials were very embarrassed by what happened. Evidently, there was no appropriate security. Uh, the party, they didn't know about any more than I did. I asked them specific questions. Did they test his blood for drugs? They couldn't answer those questions. Very peculiar set of circumstances. They advised me, this is a very strange time in Moscow. We'd advise you, don't continue your investigation. We can't really help you. Um, better for your health if you lay off. I ignored that warning. Three days later, I had a similar experience. Uh, I was uh, hallucinating extraordinarily, uh, long story short, an LSD trip, recovered in a few days. Um, that never, you didn't take voluntarily? Never had, uh, definitely not, no. Uh, I never had any other psychological break before or after. This was 30 some years ago, so God just have told me there is no such natural phenomenon of a one peak psychological problem, psychiatric problem. So I've concluded that there were two Jokings with LSD, my father and me, uh, one to neutralize us and especially with me to discredit any investigatory activity that I did afterwards. Uh, that was fairly effective, so that's one of the reasons for all these years before I've come forward with more evidence. The post-Moscow issue is very important because he was treated at two hospitals, one in London and one here. Paul, and in, when she was, um, so to speak, zapped with when, electroshock. When we come back from our break, we're going to learn about that, and we'll be joined by a person who studied British intelligence. And interestingly enough, and in, on connections in the show, in the last segment, we'll go to Havana, Cuba, where the people of Cuba have brought suit against the U.S. government for the government's involvement in the killing of thousands of Cubans over the last 40 years through dirty tricks. You're listening to Pacifica Radio's Democracy Now!, We'll be back in a minute. All you right. are listening Thanks, to Pacific Radio News Democracy Now!, the exception to the rulers. I am Amy Goodman, joined by Paul Robeson Jr. in the studio. As he described what happened yeah, to Daniel, his father, you could pause it. You could pause it. actually, in the early 1960s, in 1961, uh, in Moscow, uh, he feels that his father was drugged at a party. I would ask why you think that the Russians wouldn't want this investigated, considering this was in the midst of the Cold War, and if there was any thought that the U.S. government was involved with the drugging of Paul Robeson, I would think the Russians would want to make that known. Big problem, because uh, there was a total security lapse uh, that no KBG, uh, KGB would want. All right, thanks. So you kind of, I'll put the link to that, uh, the full interview if you want to listen to the rest of it, but it's for the sake of time here. But you can kind of get an understanding of what happened. And again, it's not conspiracy theory because he corroborated what he felt in the early 1960s with the evidence that he got in 1998 with the Freedom of Information Act with the declassified documents that were dealing with this. And then it came out that all these doctors were connected to that MK Ultra project. This wouldn't be the last time that the U.S. government would use psychological and, and, and uh, uh, chemical warfare against black leaders. A lot of folks think it's the same thing that happened to folks like Huey P. Newton, the leader of the Black Panther Party, except it was cocaine instead of LSD. You get them uh, hook, hooked on that so that they can't function. So there was all types of things that, uh, that were done. Um, with, with that being said, Robeson would um, eventually come back to the U.S., he would continue to be uh, drugged and, and uh, electric shock therapy throughout a, a lot of the 60s. But there were times where he was very lucid um, and was able to contribute, but he had slowly started to, his health, his, other, his physical health started to deteriorate a little bit as well. His wife died in 1965, his Londa Robeson died in 1965 um, from cancer. Um, so he was living with his son for a while, then he ended up living with his sister in Philadelphia. And he's, he's able to write sometimes. And one of the last great pieces he writes in 1965, he writes a memorial for W.E.B. Du Bois, who had died in 63. Um, and he, you know, is a very good uh, uh, essay on 
uh, Du Bois and his life and what he meant to, to Robeson. And this is up, will be up on the course website as well. But he, he doesn't really engage with the public for the last 10 years of his life. Um, he would keep up with the civil rights movement and the black power movement through his son and read the newspaper and do different things. And um, he would write, make statements, but not really go out in public. Only a few times. He came out for uh, the poet Lorraine Hansberry's uh, funeral. He gave a very moving speech, and people were happy for that. Um, and there was another event, I think it was a birthday celebration, maybe in 68. Uh, that he uh, actually attended, but very few things that he actually would come out for. And um, he ends up moving to Philadelphia with his sister, where he uh, passes away in 1976. And by this time in the early 70s, this is where the, because of the drugging, the electric shock, he had been out of the public eye for a while. This is where the kind of forgetting about Paul Robeson starts to occur. You know, you still had people, the Sidney Portiers, the Harry Belafonte's, the other, Harry Belafonte used to visit him in, in, in Philadelphia as well. Um, but for the masses, it kind of became out of sight, out of mind. Oh, Paul Robeson is sick, you know, what, what's going on? And then the civil rights movement had, you know, really commenced. So you had King on the scene, you had Malcolm, then that transitioned to the black power movement. So there's a lot going on. So Robeson kind of slips into the background of people's consciousness. And again, up until this point, his, his records are still not being put out. You know, he's, his previous work is still being suppressed. And the beginning to forget starts to emerge. So when he's in Philadelphia, living in West Philadelphia, you know, there'd be times he's sitting on the porch and, you know, he's talking with his sister and things like that. And, you know, he would talk to people in the neighborhood. They would just see him as that nice man down the street, not realizing that this was one of the more famous thinkers and artists in the world because it, it had already begun. You get about a generation of people that don't know who he is. So he passes away in 1976, and then there's a, a, a lot of memorials, a lot of uh, 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 tributes and celebrations. But it begins that process of, OK, now that he's dead, how do we reconstruct this narrative around who he is to make it palpable for folks to have the athlete, the actor, and all this, but not the activist? The watered down version of Robeson. Because remember, a lot of people get honored and things once they're dead, and they're no longer seen as a threat. Or they're no longer seen as they can be uh, uh, used against US imperialism or those types of things. But folks wouldn't remember, and, and people would continue to fight. People like Mary Baraka, who was one of the founders of the Black Arts Movement, who talked a lot about Robeson. As I mentioned, Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, Ossie Davis, who was another uh, compatriot of Robeson and uh, had worked with Robeson during his lifetime. And they kept that memory alive. We see more centers and things open on Robeson. Right before I started this class, actually, I had a really, really profound conversation Completely, I don't believe things are by accident. You know, the ancestors, the spiritual world puts you in places where you're supposed to be to let you know that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. But right in the summertime, when, when I decided I was going to have this class, but I hadn't really figured out what we're gonna, when we were going to do it. Um, actually, I knew when we were going to do it, but I still was in the early stages of it. My wife comes to me one day after, after work, after I get done working, and she says, oh, uh, Kari made these two friends in the neighborhood, and uh, the, the two little children's parents are at the park, and they all want to meet at the park. You want to come? I'm like, I'm tired. I really don't feel like going to the park, playing with the kids, but all right, I'll go. So, you know, you do things like that when you're married. You got to go. <laughs> so I go, and, and I'm talking to uh, meet the, the two little playmates and their parents, nice young people, and their names are escaping me around. I'm sorry. But also, uh, uh, the, uh, the mother says, you know, my father is from the States, and he's a professor as well. And he's here, you should, you should meet. He's an older gentleman. So I meet him. We get to talking. Come to find out, we're, you know, we're connected to a lot of the same people. He grew up and went to high school near the university that I work at, Cheney University in Pennsylvania. Um, and we get to talk. We know some of the same people. We start talking about Mr. Charles Bloxon. And I tell him that, oh, you know, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm starting a course on Paul Robeson, and uh, I'm going to be teaching it. And he said, really? He said, you know, back in the late 60s and the 70s, 
I organized at Rutgers some of the early celebrations for Robeson and the course and courses on Robeson. I didn't realize I was talking to Harold Weaver. Uh, Harold Weaver is a, a great scholar. Dr. Harold Weaver is a great scholar on uh, anthropology and social movements, and he's written tremendously on Robeson. And it's just amazing that I had no, I was just going to the park. This is right here in Ottawa. It's right down the street. I'm just going to the park just to meet, <laughs> and we have this two-hour conversation. So it's just, for me, it was ancestor validation of doing this class was supposed to happen. But Harold Weaver and others, they kept Robeson's legacy alive. And they kept making sure, they made sure that it wasn't just the Robeson up to 1949 that folks remember, that it was his activism, that it was his workers' uh, movement activities and his activities against colonialism and his ideas that were being pushed. But as the decades would unfold, again, imperialism never sleeps. <laughs> so the, the massaging of Robeson's image to fit what uh, was palpable to black communities. This is the same thing that was done with King, same thing that was done to do with Malcolm X, same thing we, up here in Canada, we talk about Viola Desmond and others, and other activists, and other, Nelson Mandela, other people of our heritage that when they're dead, they become safe so that we could take their image and, 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 and mold it into something else. That's the purpose of this course. It's for you all to learn about Robeson, his, his legacy, his life, all the things that he contributed so that we could push against that. And not just Robeson, but other figures in our history. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of this class, it was dedicated to Charles Bloxon, who passed away this year, who uh, used to visit Robeson at his house, who, who was his idol. Um, all of this uh, is all designed so that the next generation of folks get a true picture of Robeson and his efforts at African freedom and this giant's ability to still inspire us to be great and not just great at the things we do, but also great in the service of our people. So again, I encourage you to read the books by his son. If you get your copy of Here I Stand, read it, see what applies to 2023. And right now, we'll just open it up to general questions and comments. And um, actually, we'll throw our question out to all of you. And what do you think we can take from Robeson's life in 2023? Or what from this, this course? And again, go to the course website. There'll be more things uh, there uh, that folks think is, uh, that, that you'll find interesting. But I'll open that question up. What do people think about the legacy of Paul Robeson. We'll leave the recording on for a little bit just to uh, hear some people's responses, and then we'll turn off the recording for open discussion soon. But I just want to throw that out to, to the chat and to the folks that are listening. What do you think about Robeson's life and his legacy in 2023? Uh, David H., go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Ledbetter. I was thinking that the way the community didn't turn against him even after they had press stating or citing that he had betrayed them or was doing something nefarious and the way that they they didn't turn against him because he actually took the time in his leadership role to build that trust to build that relationship with them over time and was showing accountability and discipline and so they use that as evidence to to back their understanding and their belief in him despite what they would read or see in the press about him and i find that that's something that needs to be mirrored or more of happening more often in leadership today. Thank you. Definitely a lot, a lot of lessons for leadership. I, I, I concur uh, with that statement. We got uh, something in the chat from uh, it's like, uh, Grace Monroe, an amazing man, stands tall as a man of integrity and purpose. Yes, very much so. Uh, again, someone that we should be introducing to our young people as one of our great giants in history. I would love to see more reports on Robeson uh, because, again, like I started this class, I always, and even in that, that, that Senate testimony, 
it reminds me that I, just one thing I forgot to mention when at the beginning when I was going through all his achievements, I forgot he was a lawyer. Like, I forget sometimes the things that he does. He had to remind the committee. It's like, I'm a lawyer. Yeah, he had a law degree. I forgot to mention that as well. This is how amazing he was. And this is an example of you can do all of these things and not have to uh, give up your integrity and to continue to be a lifelong learner, because that's what he was. He learned all these languages, and he was able to contribute. So yeah, he was an amazing man uh, in Stan Talk. So I'll go to Robin, and then uh, see you.